invitation to London and to this uh, workshop. Uh, I guess it is not unexpected, but you will see emerging during my talk a few connections for this precise and immediate with other talks that we have heard before. Um, the title is, of course, a bit of a provocation. I mean, human factors in mathematics, this can be anything. So you should read it from the end. I mean, you see I'm trying at least also in the title by specifying a time span to be relatively precise and to narrow down my subject and certain phenomena. So in the introduction, I'm going to explain to you what I will really be talking about, not any old human factor you might uh, want to be able to associate to the practice of mathematics because there are good many. So just to get into the subject, um, the what what I will be addressing, but more precisely in the period that I have been indicating, is something which just to fix ideas I I can explain by introductory remarks of Husserl to his uh, famous crisis. So, this is 1935. Jean Michel yesterday uh, put a lot of emphasis on this year 1935 in his talk from this point of view. And uh, the other parallels are not parallels between two talks. So, looking back from 1935, Edmund Husserl, writing about the crisis of all the sciences um, and his kind of doing philosophy, he, uh, he just says, I mean, observes that there, that something happened around the turn of the last century, the bender, the reversal, the turnaround of the last century in the general appreciation of the sciences. It did not concern their fact of being sciences, that's their scientificity, but what they had meant and could mean for the human being, for the existence, the human existence. He uses the word Dasein because in 35, of course, he writes after his pupil Heidegger has already, his former student Heidegger has already introduced this uh, word Dasein into philosophical terminology. And then he goes on and on uh, <coughs> describing the terrible effect of positive science as it was felt at, starting at the end of the 19th century. There is this sentence which is almost impossible to translate really into English. Bloße Tatsachen, Wissenschaften machen bloße Tatsachen Menschen. So, mere sciences of facts create mere human beings of facts or fact or whatever. And you get the idea. So, this is uh, something that Husserl observed, of course, he was not at all the only one. I just took it out of the introduction. And I'm not going to talk about Husserl uh, really anymore. So, um, how do you address this? Uh, big topic, this, this general feeling as it was expressed by people in the 1930s in a historically, historically uh, sound uh, way. Uh, one way of, so first of all, I do something terrible in my talk. I select six individuals and will make comments on them, trying to give very short portraits of them. I don't have much time. And, and, well, we'll see what this gives or what it doesn't give. The list is, of course, not exhaustive. I would have liked to have somebody printed in there. Didn't I didn't have time for this uh, in, in preparing the talk. And, and anyway, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just examples. Look at it as this. It's examples, and of course, the people that I chose are people that I feel I have at least a little bit to say about. So this is the main criteria. And um, if you ask for historical approaches to the whole thing that I am trying to attack, then there is a very, very unlucky and, and, and terrible notion. Terrible because it was, of course, used by certain uh, actors retrospectively in more or less apologetic, apologetic um, aims to describe what happened in the period that I'm talking about as a conservative revolution. Uh, thinkers that had modern ideas of, so of sorts, but uh, at the same time were profoundly and tried to stay profoundly conservative. So this is a very difficult notion. I mentioned it right at the beginning, saying also that it is difficult and I'm unhappy with it, because uh, cert at certain points, 
at least one example that I give, uh, this really comes in as a, as, as a major point of view. There is another way of uh, trying to capture at least part of what Husserl was talking about, and this is, uh, since we're talking about science, uh, this is uh, the, what, what in history of science is, is the study of holism in, um, in science. And uh, to fix ideas, I'm, I'm referring to Anne Harrington's book, Reenchanted Science, which you may or may not know, and I give you, for what it's worth, my uh, hands-on definition of holism just to narrow it down, because Jean-Michel talked about holism in a much more global way. So for me, an opinion or a movement or a research program in science, in science, is holistic if it consciously calls for changing current practices of the science in question with a view to counteract one or several of the following existing tendencies, which are, this is part of the definition, perceived to be unhealthy, and replace them by a corresponding alternative tendency. So either it's against separation of scientific disciplines in favor of unity, or it's against a research by dissecting or analyzing things and in favor of a totality taking into account a total appreciation of an object or a phenomenon. Or, and this is the case which will interest us most in the examples that I'm about to present, it's against alienation, just as Husserl just said in the introduction to his physics, of the scientific reality from the immediately intuitive or the lived evidence from the human uh, Dasein existence. And it is something the holistic movement tries to restore some of the uh, unity, some of harmony between the human existence and the fact of doing science. So uh, I have some examples you can look at it. Most many of them are, not all of them, are from, from Anne Harrington's book. Of course she only talks about Germany and I, my most my of my examples are also in Germany, but anyway. Um, they, this is this is more general. Okay. Um, but not all the authors that we're going to see fall into the holistic thing. So I I, I say right away, before even starting my list, that uh, this holistic approach, this notion of holism in science, is not uh, comprehensive enough to capture the whole phenomenon that we are talking about, and this will be illustrated. So here we go. Number one, Brauer. I mean, okay, so this is a quote. Intuitionism considers, that this is the thing, intuitionism as created by Brauer, considers the falling apart of moments of life into qualitatively different parts to be reunited only while remaining separated by time, time he accepts, space he doesn't accept as a agreement, as the fundamental phenomenon of the human intellect, passing by abstracting from its emotional content into the fundamental phenomenon of mathematical thinking, the intuition of the bare two oneness things that are only separated by time, and then from there creating the natural numbers, the infinite the sequence of natural numbers. All mathematical sets of units which are entitled to that name, mathematical set of units, can be developed out of this basic, so in this translation which is in this uh, intuition. So, um, of course, his background is, is fairly colorful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, philosophical background, and then of course there is this enormous mathematical work. I just give a short list of uh, publications or I mean, you know, the participation in the significs movement of Manoui, Torrey, and Welby. Um, uh, sometimes, at least for the older people, that the two older people that I select, it is very important to say explicitly where they stand, where they position themselves with respect to David Hilbert. Hilbert being sort of the incarnation of a, of a free paradisiacal axiomatic approach to uh, mathematics, which promises you to at least in principle after reformulation solve all mathematical problems. 
And, um, and there, of course, the, the tension between Bauer and Hilbert is something that, has been, that starts very early in the 1910s and goes on and, and, and grows. And finally, um, there is this live in 1928. And the political counterpart of, uh, of this, uh, this is one of the big points in Anne Harrington's book, of course, that, that German holism. Uh, very often, or typically, is accompanied with certain nationalistic, rightist political tendencies, is uh, Brauer's active uh, participation with people not known as a in the 20s or in, for example, the boycott of the German participation in the Bologna ICM. Okay, so uh, what about the human factor here? I think one can. Um, classify Brouwer as somebody who tried to um, enact and, and live a holistic movement inside mathematics. His intuition is holistic in that sense that in the last sense of in my definition, because it is founded on this immediate intellectual uh, evidence that we have. Note, however, this is very different from what Jean-Michel was talking about uh, yesterday uh, in his talk in Russia. Uh, this, this evidence that Brauer wants to base all of mathematics on is pre-language. There's no name, there's no sign, even introduction of symbols uh, he was very hesitant about. So it's a, it's a solipsistic, uh, symbol-free, pre-language grounding but it is holistic in the sense that it is definitely an alternative to uh, mainstream mathematics and, and it claims to be better than mainstream mathematics because it is grounded in this immediate human evidence. And then uh, many authors writing about Brouwer have of course noticed that the things that he is most famous for in mathematics, the fixed point theory, the invariants of dimension and so on, uh, is not proved at least not the first time around, or sometimes not at all, um, by intuitionistic means. So, um, so, so there is this whole holistic program, and he definitely has all these publications along these lines, but there's also the rest, there's also the other side of his um, work. Okay? So, wow, oh, I think uh, this is a very well-known example, so hopefully enough if I do as quickly as I just did. Um, I come to somebody who most of you may not know, Hugo Dingler. So just to make sure that we're not talking about a pure philosopher, I mean, he started out as a mathematician. He wrote a thesis in Munich under all the first and differential geometry. And after that, he did his habilitation directed by Alfred Pringsheim and um, uh, in, in, in theory, in set theory. Come to a set theory and uh, even things that, that in a way touch later work of Brouwer, but, but not in the same spirit, uh, how, to, how to actually write down real numbers uh, given as sequences of fundamental, as, as limits of uh, fundamental sequences of fundamental and so on. So, trained as a mathematician, but very soon develops uh, much more fundamental and philosophical interests and actually turns away from mathematics in in a very important way, and then uh, the most important thing you have to know about Dinger is that he is incredibly prolific. He writes more, and on average, more than one book a year. So you have this enormous mass of books, very quickly written, not pleasant to read, and and but but so this this constitutes an enormous oeuvre, which I was is not always. Well, anyway, so, so there are a few other things you have to say about him. You have to say uh, uh, the thing which I start with here. He is an absolute unique phenomenon in the history of German philosophy of the 20th century, which is even more unique if you consider the fact that he only got a job in 1930 and lost his job in 1932, being retired because the, this was in Darmstadt, the pedagogical school, and this was closed down, so he didn't he then lived with this. So essentially he worked at home and wrote his books. But um, he was a German philosopher in that sense, had a job at least shortly before the Nazis came to power. And, um, and then he 
turned out to be extremely pro-Nazi, I mean, violent, violently anti-Semitic uh, things in the 1930s, all the way until 1945, really terrible to read, partly because, if this is a good reason, to counteract a thing that he had written about Jewish culture, which was uh, very positive in a way, in 1919. So we had to sort of um, make, forgive, make forget this, this old book of his. So anyway, but this is no excuse, of course. And so even though he was this, and even though he was the only philosopher, along with a few other big Nazi philosophers like Bäumler and Krieg, who, however, had their jobs until 45 before they lost them, but then after World War II, his influence really starts. This is the phenomenon with Heidegger, Heidegger, was of course pro-Nazi, as everybody knows, and turned away from this in 34, 30, 34 35, and um, 35, and turned away, well, whatever. I mean, at least he was not he was not writing stuff the way Dingler was writing. And um, but but uh, all the others who kept on doing this until 45 immediately went into oblivion, whereas Dingler uh, Dingler's influence started the very influential Lorenzen School, the Erlangen School of Constructive Mathematics and so on. And through that, it is the case today that about 60% of all those who have a job in a philosophy department in Germany today at a German university somehow can be sort of genealogically uh, traced back to, to Dingler or his followers. That is not to say that all these people are Dinglerianer in the in the worst. I'm, I'm not saying that. Don't forward it. But, but I mean, it's, it's just as a as a phenomenon of of, of academic genealogy and, and indirect networking influence. It's just amazing. So and and not only that, but then people like Feierabend. If you read Feierabend's uh, uh, autobiography or his correspondence with uh, Hans Albert, you know, Hans Albert is a critical rationalist. Uh, doing things a little more intelligently than Popper. Um, uh, the, even there, you, you see all these allusions to Dingler. And they say, yeah, yeah, we read Dingler and we thought it was very inspiring. So, so anyway, so what is he doing? Um, this is the, the blue thing. Well, he has various uh, assets that he comes up in his works. One thing is to found geometry, Dingler thinks you need some evidence, some, some, some some real hands-on thing to do. And so his thing is the three-plaque procedure. So you have three things of metal or something, which more or less are planar. And then you rub them with sand and so on. You rub them against each other, but alternating. Not just two of them, but then putting away one, and then taking the other one, and then putting this again, and then the other two, and so on. And once you keep doing this for a long time, um, one can prove that you get a better and better and better approximation of the Euclidean plane, of the real plane. So this for him shows and is the only way to really show constructively you know, uh, the existence of a plane, of the Euclidean plane. And then it is necessarily, if you do it with two, you could have uh, something like this. I mean, you know, but, but if you take three, this is not the case. So you have a plane, and then by intersecting planes you get Euclidean lines, and so on. And so this way you prove that the only geometry that's possible is Euclidean, really. And of course, he is against relativity theory. And also those followers, I mean, Lorenz and Janich, I mean, until today, I mean, the, 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 some of the followers of the school are anti-relativity theory, which, of course, you can always be. I mean, you, by convention, you can say, you have to explain all these phenomena differently. Anyway, so. Uh, so he is a conventionalist of this uh, constructive sort, if you want. For him, this is very important to have, on the one hand, this basis in nature and this way of producing the Canadian plants. That's one thing. The other thing, and, and it's not so clear in his writings how these things are articulated one against the other, the other thing is that he, um, he very much likes Hilbert, which you wouldn't have expected. And especially Hilbert's Foundations of Geometry. For this, for him, this is not at all a contradiction. He likes this axiomatic procedure. In fact, he, pro he proposes an axiomatic um, uh, founding of all the sciences, in particular also physics, also not against Hilbert, on the contrary. 
but, but of course he thinks philosophically uh, a little further than, than Hilbert did, and so the other element which can strike one as, as holistic or human or whatever, is that he says, well, I mean, axiom systems start from axioms, or, or even if you, if you try to, to formalize logic, I mean, you have to start somewhere, and so then, once you get to the, to the beginning of your sequence of deductions, somebody has to justify that this that you are starting from is really at the beginning. And there you need your free will. And this voluntaristic principle is the other element which uh, ensures that you can do axiomatics very freely, but because of this necessary voluntary act you need at the very start of your science, you are in harmony with uh, life. So it's the villains and truth. So this, these are some of the things that always uh, that always come back in this work. And I just note here, I mean, that there are so many books I cannot, and it wouldn't make more sense to put the titles down. But uh, and there's one book about the principle of the logic independence in mathematics, which is dedicated to Hilbert and Cotensor, the inventor of the numbers. So I mean, he he really tries to be on top, at least at that time, until World War One. Definitely on top of the modern mathematics. Uh, at the same time, he has all these um, philosophical um, uh, preferences or persuasions that he's trying to get across. Um, so it's he's a holism of sorts, so we will find some. Now I come to somebody who's, of course, much well, much better known, uh, Hermann Weyl. Uh, everybody knows his name. And I will therefore be very brief. Um, as far as I see him, at least in the first part of the period that I'm talking about, he is moving through three different phases. So the first phase, illustrated, for example, by the preface to his book, Die Idee der Imaginfläche, from 19, what is it, 13. Um, this is a, a phase where he already has all these longings for a better harmony between this formidable formalism of mathematics and the really human interests. Um, but it remains rhetorical. It remains in the preface. He, it's in the, it's, it's, he, he, he appeals in, in, in flowery German to, to the reader to say, you have to work, reader. You have to dig out behind my formalism and behind the scarce words that I can write into my book, the true idea, the pearl from the ground of the sea and the, uh, from the topos, atopos, espratos, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's this rhetoric. So this is rhetoric, and then comes World War I, and he is drafted, and then he is liberated back to Zurich, uh, where he now is a professor, and, uh, and, and after coming back from this World War One service, which was for him not at all fighting or anything, he was just working in, in the barracks somewhere. But uh, but but he, he started afresh and thought about many things. He read Fichte and he read uh, Meister Eckhart. So this is interesting as a parallel, which however doesn't quite work with the mystical interests of uh, that Brauer got from Holland early on, ten years earlier. This master and, 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 and then from Poland was a Hegelian also. So you have uh, similar influences. Of course, many people read Master Eckhart, the German uh, sermons during World War I in Germany. This was sort of deep intellectual fashion to do. But, um, but so under the influence of that, he, he, he takes this very much to heart and he takes um, the feeling of endangerment in World War I into his mathematics. And the result of this is this book in 1918, Das Continuum, where he constructs a substantially poorer analysis, which has the only advantage of being absolutely secure. That is, uh, it's a predicative deduction, a construction of real numbers and deduction of properties of sequences and functions. So it's, he, he sacrifices substantial force of mathematical theories in order to reduce to a level where everybody can agree and must agree. This is a major move. But the real explosion and the real turn which then makes him for six or seven years a holist 
um, comes when he meets Brower in 1919, I guess, in December in England. And they talk, and then he jumps onto Brower's uh, wagon and, uh, and uh, makes propaganda for it as well. And he writes all these things. Brower, this is the revolution, and so on. And, uh, and so, so this is the third thing. And, and the third thing is definitely uh, holistic. And, and just a human factor may be many things, but if you talk about holism, uh, the relationship to the young generation is very important, you see. Um, the, uh, so, so I just show you this thing, which is when he gets an offer simultaneously after World War I from Berlin and from Göttingen. And everybody, including the students in Zurich, fear that he will leave Zurich. And so there's a petition by the students that have sat in on his lectures. And they say this, our conviction that Herr Professor Weil is irreplaceable has its source in the following reasons. We admire him the ingenious creator of new cultural values, which consist in that the exact sciences come into fruitful interaction with life itself. It is this exceedingly fortunate fusion of the man and the scholar in Professor Weil, which inspires in each one of us a sense of liberation and seems to us to guarantee most surely that whole men, this is in German, this is ganze Leute, this is Swiss German, Leute is the plural of Mann in Swiss German, not in high German. Um, so whole men will emerge from the 8th section. 8th section is the Department of Mathematics at that time at ETH in Zurich. So you see the Okay, I go through my list of people and I come to somebody who is most definitely not, uh, not somebody qualified as holistic. I just found it, just, just to go back to Hermann Weil, who was born in 1895, and only three years later, something one doesn't realize, uh, Helmut Hasse is born. So Hasse is um, not working in the same kind of mathematics, but certainly very important mathematician in this time, in number theory, and yeah, number theory. Um, he had the not holistic, so no, no way one can construe this, and I don't want to do this, I just, on the contrary, I can use him as an example to point out that he's not. But he had, of course, definite ideas about how to do mathematics, which method to apply to prove certain theorems, and, 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 and several times in his life, when he had proved the big theory, he would two or three years later publish another proof, conceptually different but more satisfying for reasons that he would then lay out in his um, in his paper. And but but there are little things. Uh, so for example, in 1929, he writes a very long. This is his way of doing it. I mean, five or six page long book review of Landau's monumental, Edmund Landau's monumental lectures on number theory. And uh, there he warns that in spite of the true mathematical life which pulses, this pulse here, pushing inside, which pulses between the lines, and in spite of the strong personality of Landau, which you can feel through the book, Landau's style may lead only to a formal understanding as opposed to, well, how do you translate this? Inhaltliches Verstehen. Inhaltliches Verstehen. So this is, um, okay, understanding with regard to essential content in, in some sort of holistic sense. That the new generation, he says, that our generation aspires to. I mean, so he, he sets himself apart from this old Landau, the generation before him, and his current generation, and he said, we are not happy to just have a formally, absolutely correct deduction of a result, but we want inhaltliches Verstehen, whatever this is. So this is and, and another, uh, now this is something very strange. Ah, yeah, this is the original. Um, he has this correspondence um, starting in 37, I believe, and going on at least two years or three years into the war with Gaston Julien, the one of the Julia sets, you know, a uh, very conservative uh, French uh, mathematician who was, of course, uh, visibly uh, 
injured in, in World War One, having his nose cut off. And so, in, and, and so this, there is this letter that Hasse writes to Julia on 10th of December 1941. We are right in World War II. And it's written in French, because at that time Hasse does not work on number theory, but he works for the German Oberkommando der Marine, Marine, uh, on differential equations if you shoot torpedoes. And, um, and so in Berlin he, he has uh, some Russian who helps him and who is a teacher of French. And so he corrects his French. So here's this French uh, letter from uh, Hasse to Julia, and in English this reads, I still remember very well the corresponding to today, corresponding period after World War I. At that time, in spite of our national debacle, um, German national debacle at the end of World War I, my generation felt uplifted by a powerful wave towards scientific studies, towards key work in discussions about God and the world. This is Gordon Dino, this is German, but he puts it into French as a consolation for the national plight and as a natural reaction for those four years of spiritual sterility, which is probably described World War I. So um, Hasse has some ways of interpreting certain things that he uh, does or wants to do or wants to see done in mathematics against some human um, background, but um, that's where it stops. And now I come to Chevalier, who has been mentioned several times. He has been mentioned yesterday by Jean-Michel and this morning by in the central thing. So, of course, Chevalier, you know, in French algebraized, co-founder of the uh, Bobaki group. But, and, and what is also known, uh, I guess, by many people is that he had an extensive literary activity uh, outside of mathematics or parallel to his mathematics in the 1930s. And at that time, he was, as of its uh, creation until its death, group of this non uh, member of this non-conformist group, Ordre Nouveau. Ordre Nouveau of the 1930s. If you're French, it's not to be confused with Ordre Nouveau of the 1970s. Uh, which is uh, a political, one of these non-conformist groups, small group, 15 people maybe, Max uh, participating, meeting regularly, putting out a journal as of 1933, and their slogan is Ni neither to the right, neither to the left, politically. Uh, the only thing which is completely clear to all these non-conformists, not only Ordre Nouveau, also Esprit, is that the parliamentary system, doesn't, that parliamentary democracy doesn't work. So that's out. We have to look for something else. We need a revolution, but this revolution should be prepared by careful intellectual work. Then it will be a little less bloody. And, uh, and they come up with all kinds of ideas. Among them, uh, they are one of the first groups that, that conceive of this idea of a Europe of the regions, not of Europe as a union of nations, but of regions, which has, again, a certain um, Bible uh, decades ago. Anyway, uh, another name for this uh, philosophy is per personalism, personalism, uh, because they wouldn't call themselves individualists. So they, they were, they were. Uh, well, okay, I'd say, say something more about this. And now the, the whole thing is that it, it, there are, there's good evidence, and some of this I'm going to present. Um, and one of the evidence is also that Chevalet always wanted to have his collected papers published completely, not just the math, but also his political writings, which are very numerous, and uh, or philosophical writings. So there's, there's evidence that you should read these two things in parallel. And now this brings me to this other point I said about conservative revolution, and this, this is a very unlucky notion, but there have been several studies, this is one of them, um, on uh, conservative revolution in France and all these, and, and the question, can you establish a parallelism between these groups of the beginning 30s in France and what happened in Germany in this so-called conservative revolution all the way over the 20s and 30s. So Germany starts earlier. 
the reason for these for this decade of uh, translation that you have here is that um, that France, of course, is doing pretty well after World War One psychologically because it's one World War One. This is I'm sorry, this is a stupid sentence, but I. Uh, the, the, there is a, I mean, there is a feeling that France is doing better and better also economically, and it is actually uh, when the world uh, economic crisis hits Europe, France is the last country that is hit. France in 1930-1931 plays the role of what Germany plays today uh, with the crisis of the Euro. I mean, the, 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 there is no uh, substantial unemployment uh, before the beginning of 1931. So, so this, there's this delayed reaction, and when finally the crisis hit France, this is this enormous delay. This is what what creates this intellectual response by various non-conformist groups. Okay, so um, but to start very uh, calmly, I mean, here is an article from always the same year, 1935, not in this autumn before, but in the uh, more general philosophy paper, Variation du style mathématique. One of the things when we are having a conference on mathematical cultures is, of course, what is the difference between culture and style? Maybe there is none. Maybe these are interchangeable if you really want to go into the notion of style. So Chevalier talks about styles and he says styles in mathematics change over time and he calls the change from one to the other, he calls it a revolution, but this must not be taken too. Literally, and um, and then he essentially discusses in this article, I wrote it quickly, only two styles, and he sets them against each other. Uh, it's Weierstrass's style of the epsilons, uh, his point about, uh, you know what this means, I mean, doing precise uh, analysis with uh, uh, defining the continuity in terms of epsilon, and the convergence, and so on. And also, this is important because it's not brought out by Epsilon alone, the fact that you construct your real numbers, you construct everything, all the objects, <coughs> in an arithmetical way, from whole numbers, rational numbers, sequences, and so on. So, so this is that that type of arithmetized constructing analysis and mathematics. Um, which at the time, as he explains, was an answer to these uh, counterexamples, these weird functions that nobody had uh, seen coming before, and so on. And he contrasts this Weierstrass style to the current style that he is now presenting and advocating and practicing of the 1920s and 30s. And the, the, the transition between the two is exactly what was mentioned in the talk this morning. I mean, the fact that, for example, Chevalet, I mean, in this tensor definition, he wants to do it without coordinates. Choosing coordinates spoils natural invariance of the notions, whereas you are now looking in this uh, structure-oriented mathematics, you are looking exactly for the true aspect of your object that you are studying, which is invariant under such and such, and try to place every theorem uh, in the context of a proof, which at one point he says it in the paper, has the same group of transformations as the theorem. The proof should have the same group of transformations. You should find the so it's 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 a picture of complete paradise and harmony. It's like the once you you apply this conceptual analysis, uh, this axiomatic axiomatizing analysis of your mathematical results, everything falls naturally into place. And this um, paper can, of course, uh, be read as the first manifesto before the name of Bourbaki. It is the first manifesto of Bourbaki. If you read it, that's exactly what it is. But that's not all that Chevalet Things when he writes this, even though it is not in this paper. So if you found this paper by his other writings, you find other things. For example, there is another publication on Vigueur in the Axiomatic, which does still not disclose the real thing. But you find what he is after and why he uh, praises this new mathematical method, this Bobaki approach, 
in such an intense way when you look at things that he co-offers with Armand Dondieu, uh, one of the founders and principal uh, driving minds until his death in early 1934, I think, of the Group Auto Nouveau. So here again, they do not only publish in their own journal, Auto Nouveau, political journal, but also again in the philosophical. There is this Hilbertian logic and psychology. And uh, so to give you, to get to the point of this paper, <coughs> and which leads us beyond what we have seen before, we are thus led, right, Chevalier and Longue, to describe mathematics as a purely formal science, in which every intuitive act is confined by an irreducible data, the axiom that we have given you, and which proceeds by operations of the mind that are analogous to metamathematical reasoning, but out of necessity contain concrete psychological elements. And then, a little later here, comes this thing which repeats precisely the political statements that Arnold Nouveau always makes. We are neither Marxist nor capitalist, neither this nor that, neither ni gauche, ni droite, and so on. We are not all of that. And so, we are neither in favor of Dedekind's deductivism neither in favor of mathematical intuitionism, be it Borel or Studi, he doesn't mention Brauer here, uh, and so on. Rather, the point is, what is given to the Hilbertian mathematician, the axiom that he starts from to develop a field, what he works and acts on in the course of his ongoing progress towards generality, will be itself, well, it will be abstract from logical. But from the psychological point of view, because this is the concrete thing that he is working on and trying to develop and, and, and show what comes out of it, from the psychological point of view, he plays the role which in other forms of human activity evolves upon concrete. That's the point. So, Chevalet, in his thinking, partly helped by Don Dieu, but anyway, I mean, they were in contact uh, twice every week as long as he was alive, and then Chevalier carried on this thing for another eight years in publications. Um, Chevalier found a way of integrating this human factor, which almost strikes us as holistic, which may remind us of the voluntaristic aspect of Inga when it comes to axioms, carry this over into his Bobakistan mathematics, which is quite amazing. Which is not um, so, just to give you the background, I mean, these are three books authored by Robert, not Raymond, Robert Aron and Armand Dandieu, around the time where the crisis hit France. Le Cancer Américain, La Révolution Nécessaire, Décadence de la Nation Française, you get the idea. <laughs> so, um, and, and what, of course, I mean, this, this is, these are total books, every single one of them, I mean, the whole world is, is constructed and so on. And, and this is the, uh, the Lord of Nouveau, the journal that they have. What is um, expounded in these books, and what apparently, according to what they tell us, was the invention of Don Lieu, is the méthode dichotomique. So what is the dichotomic method? The dichotomic method, which is at the heart of what Chevalier thinks about mathematics and how one should and really ought to do with mathematics, is a method by which you separate in every single subject you are addressing the truly human from whatever is non-human. For example, a typical example that Don Yu always gives of his dichotomic method. You look at a worker in the factory, a very important subject for their reflections. They actually, in 1935, they, they go, they have no, 34, no. 34, 35, in the summer, they actually go into the factories in order to give a few workers that they substitute for two weeks of paid holiday. They work for free in factories. They only do this once. But anyway, <laughs> um, so, but, but you see, they, they're really, they're, so the dichotomic method applied to the worker in the factory is, look at what the worker does. He is there in front of his machine. So there are things that he does mechanically which a machine could do for him. This is no good. This you separate. 
whatever remains is the kind of work which is which is something that a human being should be doing. So this is dichotomic method, separate between the two and then try to change the world so that human beings are only doing great work. And what I was just showing you is the application of the dichotomic method to mathematics. There are other articles where he applies the dichotomic method to physics. Of course, Vienna circle is out. So they are, they are anti-positivistic and at the same time they are scientists in a way. So it's, it's, it's this incredible way of being between the dividing lines that everybody seems to take for granted. Um, so, okay, necessary evolution, reflection centered on truly human element, I already said this, mitotico to Um This is funny, this is uh, at the very beginning of this whole uh, reaction, intellectual French reaction to the economic crisis at the end of. Uh, at the end of 31, there is a, uh, a special issue of Nouvelle Revue Française, Cahier des Revendications. So it's a list of what everybody is, is asking for uh, of these groups. And there, it's Chevalet and Dantieu who present the ideas of, uh, of the Auto Nouveau, and the title is L'intelligence éthique, intelligence as a sort. Intelligence is not a mirror nor a tool, as other philosophers would say. It's a sort. This concept refutes capitalism, Marxism, pragmatism, and behaviorism. It's wrong. They're always in the middle. The greatest conquest of human intelligence is the creation of an abstract language in the world. Science is, in the first place, an intellectual creation which is the fruit of aggressiveness and risk. It could not continue to evolve further if it were not for the parallel development of risk and aggressiveness. And here are some of the titles of his, of his, uh, of his articles. By no means all of them. Uh, all, all, there are about 30 articles of this sort applying the dichotomic method, for example, to the question of frontiers, borders in Europe, coming up with the idea of Europe of region. This is also presented as an application of the dichotomic method. Very systematic. And this is unfortunately because I didn't in that library, they didn't have a color copy. Uh, this, this arrow is red, gleaming red. OK, so this was my presentation of Chevalet and his human factor. And uh, I contend that it is in this way that one has to read this Bovaki Manifesto before the, before the name in 1935, this variation du style mathématique of Chevalet. I come to my last person, uh, uh, Teichmüller, uh, known as the uh, ultra-Nazi among the mathematicians, and certainly at the same time uh, an extremely original mathematician. Very particular bourgeois background. Apparently, the family uh, suffered uh, quite badly from the economic crisis, which in Germany, of course, at that time before. France. Uh, he comes to the university in 1930 in Göttingen, uh, sits in on various courses, and then he joins the SA, SA, not SS, not, I mean, of course, NSDAP, the party, but I mean, most of all, he joins the SA, the stormtroopers, very early on. The idea being, and this was a role played by the SA until 1934 for, uh, for a great many. Um, followers of, uh, of the Nazi movement, um, they, the SA sort of tried to incorporate some sort of revolutionary idea, creating a new man. Um, and in November 33 in Göttingen, he meets the boycott of uh, Edmund Landau, and he justifies this with a letter, a written letter, which here yeah, is a little excerpt, I'll show it to you in English in a second. Um, before going to this, uh, uh, something which is also quite typical of the time, and um, I could develop this further, but I don't have the time to do it here, is that he then, after that, when Hasse has come to Göttingen and uh, is there, even though the, the Nazis like Teichmüller did not like Hasse either, he was too conservative in a non-Nazi sense, too not sufficiently revolutionary for them. 
he uh, agrees to participate in this famous seminar in Göttingen uh, on the structure of local fields, whatever, um, because it is not run by Hasse. This is typical. So it is officially run by Witt and Teichbüller and so on, the young students. It's a spontaneous activity of the young people. The young generation is taking over. And formally, Hasse is in the background, even though Hasse gives the, the subject, publishes the papers and tells journal afterwards and so on. So the, the thing here that he writes to Landau as a justification of the fact that he has led the student boycott of his lectures, which then led to Landau's dismissal. Uh, I also know that many university lecture courses, especially the lectures on calculus, have an educational value also. They not only lead the student into a new conceptual world, but also to a new spiritual adjustment. Like this. But since the spiritual adjustment that the individual depends on the mind that is to be adjusted, and since this mind depends, according to principle, which are not only known today, but have been known for a long time, on the racial composition of the individual, it will, as a rule, not be recommended to have, for instance, even arrogant students talk from Jewish teachers. I can testify to this from my personal experience used to calculus lectures in Frankfurt. Um, okay, so uh, why am I, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning uh, Teichmüller because the question arises, what is this? This letter is a part of this political fight that he, that he does, and he, uh, he, well, he does it. But did, so, so you, you, you can say lots of things in such a letter, and you talk about calculus or whatever. Is this rhetoric, or does this affect his doing mathematics, his mathematical practice? So there is no effect of this which is comparable to what we have seen with Brauer or with Hermann Weil in the way that they took a certain thing that they felt very strongly and changed, for example, the foundations of analysis or the way of conducting logical proofs in mathematics. There's nothing like that. It is an effect on a lower scale and concretely um, the choice of subject that he works on leaves uh, the number theory, the arithmetic algebra, structure of complete fields and so on that he had been worked on that he had been working on in Göttingen. He physically leaves from Göttingen to Berlin where he's close to Biberbach, so he feels a little bit more at home. And he changes the subject to geometric function theory and then goes on to his type of theory and so on. And then occasionally in his papers written in the later period, if not in the papers that passed through Hasse's hands and got published in the previous journal, but in the later papers we have glimpses of things like that. For example, in, in this paper here from 44, uh, it was written before, it was published in 44. Um, he says he, it, he discusses the moduli of the elliptic curves, and he says, well, so we have the straight function. And, uh, and, and you, you want to know that the straight function is a conformal function. Now, conformal, of course, is ever since Riemann and Klein has been charged with a lot of meaning in terms of intuition. I mean, in German textbooks, conformal is defined by, in, by, by leaving angles invariant, which is a stupid definition, but to appeal to intuition. So he, he plays on that tradition saying that something as geometric as the conformity of the J function, I do not want to do. So, I have now talked for 53 minutes, uh, as I see, I think, I think I would just stop here. <laughs> <laughs>